Uh, right now, we have Steve Werby up here talking about From Chaos to Bliss, so please welcome him to the stage. Wow, that's what 800 people clapping in a room that only holds 300 on a Sunday morning sounds like. Fantastic. I'm going to hold it like this. Can everyone hear me okay? From chaos to bliss, 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 bliss. How we solve security in just 20 years. Right, I'm going to take you back on a journey over the last 20 years to talk about how we collectively solve this security problem. Uh, so, so, oh. I have not had all the copy I need to have this morning, apparently. Oh. All right, so yesterday, I, I hooked up my own adapter because this adapter would not work. I may need to do that. Did one of the technical people suggest that I hook up my own adapter? I'm going to give it a try. I got a free phone. I could use a new one. So I think there's a lesson learned for everyone here. So I, I've been in the security field about 20 years, since 99. Yeah, and I, I'm a noob, and I know that if there's something that can go wrong at a presentation, it will. So I was so pleased with myself that I brought my own adapter this time. And yesterday I connected it and made sure it would work after the one that was up here didn't work. And the fool that I am, I tried the one that was up here. So we wasted a few minutes. Any case, um, yeah, so I'm a noob, but I, I look around the room and I see some people that are younger than me. Uh, so some of you are probably too young to remember the primitive, antiquated, primeval world of the second millennium. Uh, we're going to be talking about the second millennium. Uh, some of you are probably just new to the world of security. I see some people in the back that probably fit the bill. And uh, for some of you others, maybe the one that called me a noob, it's possible your recollection of the last 20 years has probably just faded a bit. All right. The font seems a little light. I'd ask you if you could read it, but doesn't really matter what your answer to the question is because I'm not going to be able to change it. Okay. So let's do a quick comparison uh, between 1998 and 2018. Uh, you see I made things pretty easy for you. I used some visual cues. I have a red font on the left and a sad face and a green font on the right and a happy face. By the way, there is at least one person in this room who I've just realized may actually appear in my slide deck. Um, if you recognize yourself, I want you to jump up and shout out. It's, it's not going to be for a while. So in, in 1998, it was pure chaos. We, we had to deal with tremendous problems like website defacements and worms, lots of worms. Today, we have things pretty easy. We have phishing, cryptojacking, social media, hijacking. It's not too bad. In 98, though, all we had for tools available were uh, passwords, firewalls, antivirus, and we had documents we call policies, even if they were standards or guidelines. Today, we have all kinds of awesome acronyms. We have CASB, we have SOAR, we have uh, machine learning and AI, or at least those are buzzwords that security companies like to use and throw around to claim they have these things. 
And we have blockchain. Blockchain is something that can pretty much solve all your problems in 2018. When, when I look back at 1998, I remember it was a much smaller security community. There were roughly 2,000 people in security. Um, I knew most of them. There's one older guy here I don't know, but I'm not sure he was around then. Today, we have roughly 3 billion people in InfoSec. And that's a pretty significant amount of growth over 20 years. Back in 98, we only had one cert, was the CISSP. Some people don't have a lot of positive thoughts about the CISSP, but it was the only one we had at that point. Today we have hundreds of certs. And back in the day, the senior most people in information security usually had titles like network admin or security guy, or they were the guy that was not in the room during a meeting and got tapped to do security. Today we have lofty titles like CISO and CSO. In 98, if you ran into the CIO and you were in security, they typically would have no idea who you were. You were just that guy that worked in the basement. Today, uh, the C-suite, the, the senior most people, whether their titles are director or CISO, are definitely very well known to the board in the C-suite. They spend a lot of time together in most organizations, and they do things like strategize. In 1998, and this is really to paint the picture for you of how much different things were in 98. There were four cons. This was one of them. There was DEF CON, there was HOPE, there was SHMU. I might be missing one or two. If we wanted to talk about security, there were three or so mailing lists in IRC. Today we have a lot easier. There's literally 1,400 different conferences. There's multiple conferences on every day of the year worldwide. Um, there's several right now in the United States this weekend. And we have Twitter. If you want to get information or share information, you have social media. You have Slack. We have a lot of ways to communicate. It's a completely different world. There also, in 98, were very few, if any, laws or regulations. PCI, HIPAA, uh, data breach notification laws at the state level, none of those existed in 98. Today we have a lot of laws and a lot of regulations. Uh, it's even very complex and complicated because uh, regulations and laws that are written by uh, nations and states that are outside of where your organization might reside will still potentially impact you based on the uh, information of the citizens that you are the custodian of. And in 98, we called it information security. Now we call it cybersecurity. So I think uh, we can all agree that we're on solid ground here in 2018 we've pretty much solved the security problem. Right, but, but, but to a degree, it really depends on how we look at what the word problem means. If we can redefine what the word is, is, then we can probably redefine what the word solution means. So uh, finding a solution basically means finding something that's causing difficulties and finding a way to address it we're finding the reason or explanation for something. If you think about those definitions, it doesn't really mean that we mitigated all the risk. So I like to interpret, interpret solution that way. All right, so some of you have a skeptical look. You're questioning uh, this truth that I'm presenting to you. And you're probably asking yourself, what makes me a credible authority? Well, I've been in security for a long time. I'm a thought leader. It's even in my title that I wrote about 10 minutes ago at the bottom of my slide. Also, I'm up here and you're not, so uh, pretty much that's really what it comes down to. That's, that's how it works in the security world. That's how it works in the world today in 2018. All right. Okay, I was just kidding a little bit. So really, this is a talk about the last 20 years. Not a particular theme. I'm not looking at this from the perspective of laws or technology or people. It's just kind of a potpourri. But there's a, a, a method to my madness. I, I really decided to take a look back the last 20 years at the problems we ran into, the things that we did better, and uh, try to figure out what we could learn from that. So what I'm hoping to do today is help you revisit some things that you may not have remembered from the last 20 years or may not have been aware of at all. And I'm hopeful that you'll be able to leverage that to look at what you accomplished in your time in the security field, what we've collectively accomplished, and think about what this means as you move forward into the next 20 years.
All right. Basically, I'm showing, you probably saw before, I said 98 to 2018. Well, this is how the math works out. I'm going to start at really 99 because if you don't understand the math here, it's probably because it's a Sunday morning. Ask a friend. All right. So to paint the picture, though, I want to let you know what was going on in the world. So I'm, I'm taking these years two at a time because that's the way I decided to do it. Uh, in the 99-2000 period, federal agents went in and took a hold of Elian Gonzalez in Miami, gave him back to his father. He ended up going back to Cuba. Everybody had to have this thing called a Furby. President Clinton was uh, acquitted. There was the Y2K bug, which was really a whole lot of nothing. And uh, there was a tragic event in Columbine at a high school. And then this dude right here, naked Richard Hatch, won the first season of Survivor. All right. So there's a lot of viruses I could talk about because this was the era of viruses, but I'm going to talk about one that is not as notable. And that's the Pikachu virus. And I want to talk about this one because it's believed to be the first virus that targeted children. So if you think about this being 18 years ago, the children that were into Pokemon, let's say they were roughly 10 or 28 today, so they're almost full-grown adults. They're millennials, so, you know, partially full-grown. So this really started a new era because before we didn't really have to worry about our children encountering malware, but... That was the dawn of the internet age, and the children that grew up in that era, the internet was pervasive. They used email, they accessed the web. It's something that we take for granted today, but back then it was a pretty new thing. This is a pretty naive piece of malware, though. Uh, what it essentially did is uh, wrote a couple lines to the autoexec batch file on Windows and attempted to delete a couple of Windows directories on reboot. It prompted the user, do you want to delete these directories? So it's not believed to have had a significant impact. Then again, it was uh, children that it was targeting. So it's possible that some of them did click yes and delete most of their Windows directories. Other uh, threats that exist in this time period include the Melissa virus, I love you, and uh, CIH, I love you was a worm. This was a period of worms and viruses, viruses and worms, and it got a lot of notoriety. The public got very concerned, and antivirus companies made a killing off of these forms of malware. Uh, CIH was pretty interesting uh, because it tried to do two things, overwrite the first megabyte of uh, the space on a hard drive, which would generally cause the system to crash or not perform on reboot, and it tried to overwrite BIOS, and it wasn't able to do that successfully for all BIOS chips, but when it did, it rendered that piece of hardware useless and required generally a technician to repair the, uh, the computer. So it wasn't quite as easy for your novice user to figure out how to address. Uh, when we think today about denial of service attacks, one of the first ones that occurred was in this time period. It was performed by a teen in Canada that went by the name Mafia Boy. And it's not really known exactly how many computers he controlled to perform these distributed denial of service attacks, but it's likely estimated it was roughly on the order of 100. You think about that, he was able to bring down Yahoo, CNN, uh, eBay, a few others. There were some he was unsex unsuccessful in bringing down, but he only controlled roughly 100 computers largely in universities. You think about today, the controls that we have in place in large organizations to mitigate distributed denial of service attacks. I mean, certainly there's still a problem, but it takes significantly more than 100 computers to send junk traffic to websites to knock them off the internet. Uh, that doesn't show up that well, but uh, that's a screenshot from the software Back Orifice 2000. It's uh, the second version of an administrative tool 
that was distributed by the Cold of the Dead Cow at DEF CON 7. Um, I personally think of it as a rat. Uh, it was often labeled as a Trojan. Some people argued that it had legitimate purposes. And certainly it could be used to legitimately manage computers, but that clearly was not the intent with this particular program. One thing that's interesting and a lot of people don't remember is that within about an hour at DEF CON, uh, CDC had burned 20 or so copies of it to CD. This was back when you had CD-ROMs and you burned things to CD and you had to be careful not to fill up more space than the CD could handle. They burned about 20 copies, handed them out. Other people took those copies and then burned them to new disks and handed them out and it kind of went viral. Within a short amount of time, people were reporting that the CD-ROM was compromised and infected with the CIH virus that I just mentioned. Well, uh, Dildog and others from CDC thought that possibly could not have been true. It, it must have been somebody that had taken one of the disks, either intentionally or inadvertently, introduced CIHS onto the copies of Back Orifice 2000. And that was their story. They got a hold of one of the original disks, put it into a machine without checking it with antivirus software. I think this is an awesome story. It really paints a picture of that particular time because these are hardcore security guys, wrote software like this, did really advanced security research, and they didn't actually run antivirus because their paradigm was, we didn't put the malware on the CD. Well, long story short, it turns out that the original CDs they distributed did have CIH, and they believe that an individual that they had asked to duplicate the original CD to make those 20 uh, infected those original 20 with CIH, probably not intentionally. But uh, for me, the big lesson there is don't make assumptions, right? They assumed that their CD was clean and it wasn't. Uh, now in the complex world of 2018, it's very important not to make assumptions. I think today that's a very fundamental one we would not make. We would uh, obviously check our, our source to see if it was compromised, check to see if the hash is mashed up to a known hash, but that did not occur in that particular case. All right, and These are uh, seven of the members of Loft Heavy Industries. Uh, a number of these folks have, have gone on to quite a bit of notoriety. Uh, the one that looks like reddish brown here, Jesus, uh, is co-founder and CTO of Veracode, which was purchased by somebody and now is part of the CA. He has much shorter hair now. And a, a few of the others work for organizations we know and are still fairly well known. They. Uh, testified in front of Congress to a, con a congressman that went on to be a DA on Law and Order, which is kind of odd, uh, and basically said that any one of the seven of them could bring the entire internet down in 30 minutes. So that got a tremendous amount of attention. Within a short amount of time, uh, Loft merged with At Stake, and eventually At Stake was purchased by Symantec. Uh, for me, when I look back, this was a critical time period because up until this point, hackers and security didn't have quite the air of legitimacy that they did after this. And I'm not saying it was overnight and it happened that everyone went from black hat, gray hat to white hat. This was one of those key moments because some of these individuals cut their hair off. I mean, sure, they were wearing suits here, but that was not a normal thing for these guys. Um, and then they joined a company providing consulting services and security awareness and doing things that are pretty mainstream today. Uh, that was pretty uncommon back then. Another interesting thing that happened this period, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on these two years and then less on the subsequent years, was that SQL injection was an attack that was detected or described by an individual that at that point went by the name Rainforest Puppy. And it's interesting, he, he published his findings on it, very excited, on FRAC but did not actually use the terminology SQL injection. All right, here's a screenshot from part of the FRAC article. Uh, doesn't mention 
what it was actually called at that point in his article. I think I have a note about that here. Oh yeah, so he, uh, he titled his article NT Web Technology Vulnerability. So he didn't actually call it SQL injection. So it's interesting how things get the terminology that is pretty widespread today. Uh, he later referred to it as batch SQL vulnerabilities. Yeah, and I think that pretty much described what he was observing he was able to do. He was able to string a couple of SQL statements together and have both of them execute. He also passed this information on to Microsoft. And Microsoft kind of laughed. He actually did this through a colleague of his and the word got back to him that, yeah, yeah, we hear you. This is not a problem. It doesn't need to be addressed. So Microsoft's actually come a long ways. I have a lot of respect for Microsoft today in 2018. They are nothing like the Microsoft of 1998. But 1998, yeah, I think that was a big deal. Sure, you could pretty much take ownership of the SQL Server and do inserts and updates and deletes and create tables. Not a big deal. And, and though uh, he, he actually published in his FRAC article at least a couple of different ways to mitigate SQL injection attacks, we still have SQL injection as a pretty large risk today. Uh, I think it's lumped together on the OWASP top 10 now as just injection. There's many kinds of, of injection. And sure, it's been solved in a lot of organizations. But you have a lot of people that uh, have to move fast or they're just not security conscious. So even though the solutions are out there, they don't implement the solutions or they don't know what those solutions are. So even though we've had fixes for this for 20 years, SQL injection is still a problem today that, that we're faced with. In the same time period, the first Palm PDA Trojan materialized. Um, when I thought about that, I, I found that pretty interesting for a few different reasons. One, it took me a moment to remember what PDA actually stood for. Um, I felt like I was kind of losing it because that was never a problem for me. Then I remembered, oh yeah, POM was a thing until BlackBerry came around and then BlackBerry was a thing until Android and iOS came around, but back then POM was a thing. The interesting thing about this particular piece of malware was that it was a Trojan that claimed to be a crack for a piece of software that was emulation software for, I think it was Game Boy, to run on Palm OS. The really fascinating thing about this piece of malware is the individual that wrote it was co-author of the software it claimed to crack. So there's a whole backstory around that and different versions of what his intent was and why he did that. But pretty odd that 18, 19 years ago, somebody created a piece of software and then created a piece of malware targeting his own piece of software. Uh, the software is called Liberty, in case you want to look it up. All right, so this is something I didn't remember until I started to look into it a few weeks ago. But cross well, I knew that cross-site scripting was something that originated about 20 years ago. What I didn't know was that Microsoft played a critical role in discovery and naming of, uh, of cross-site scripting. And so 10 years after their discovery or reporting of it, they disclosed that they had come up with a number of alternate names for it. And then the security engineers in Microsoft got together and decided Cross-site scripting feels like the right one. So uh, URL parameter script insertion doesn't quite roll off the tongue as well. Synthesized scripting, fraudulent scripting, yeah, not bad names. And so they passed that on to CERT and uh, coordinated that and CERT did a disclosure on this particular type of vulnerability. A couple, a couple of weeks ago, uh, afterwards, they too described it using some different terminology, and then ultimately uh, describe it in quotes as cross-site scripting. So if you're 
interested in the history of how it got its name, you can thank Microsoft. Continuing the Microsoft theme, an individual named Scott Culp, who at one point really was the public face of security for Microsoft, and you know, I feel bad for the guy, because uh, this was a time period where Microsoft was just taking a beating from the security community. And he published this 10 Immutable Laws of Security. And I think it's kind of fascinating to look back at it. If I was to come up with a list today, these wouldn't necessarily be my 10, uh, probably wouldn't be at all, but I think most of them still hold true with the exception of a couple of them. Uh, I would say, for me, it's number three, if a bad guy has unrestricted physical access to your computer, it's not your computer anymore. Sure, that's hypothetically true, and I understand, I understand that hardware could be modified, but for your average consumer and your average organization, if encryption is in place and we do threat modeling, then in general, um, this one is not as true as it was, not anywhere near as true as it was 20 years ago. The other one for me that I uh, get a little bit of a chuckle out of is number eight, an out-of-date virus scanner is only marginally better than no virus scanner at all. Today, I think most of us can probably agree that signature-based antivirus, which is what existed at that point, maybe with some things claiming to be heuristics, which really weren't, um, is of nominal value today. And typically, you probably would consider not even architecting your organization with that kind of technology. It's one of those things that's kind of hard to make the case to get rid of. Uh, it's kind of like back in the day, uh, you went with IBM because no one ever got fired for going with IBM. It's very hard for most people to exercise their political capital to say, I want to turn off AV, though I, I am aware of a number of organizations and people have been doing that over the last few years. It's still not that common. So for me, those are the two that really stand out. He updated this list five or so years after that, didn't make a lot of changes. I think he changed antivirus to anti-malware. Uh, but, you know, a lot of this does still ring true today. And so you can look at that a few different ways. Uh, maybe we haven't accomplished a whole lot or certain things are just really pervasive. All right, moving on to 2001, 2002. Um, Lord of the Rings came out, 9-11 happened, Michael Jackson was still alive and almost killed his kid dropping him off the balcony of a hotel, he didn't do that. Five hour energy, that didn't exist before that. He had to drink a thing called jolt cola or just uh, caffeine pills. We invaded Afghanistan and uh, honestly, I, I didn't remember Neopets, I guess it's still around. But uh, Neopets, at this point in time, at that point in time, was the fourth most trafficked website on the internet. Google was number 12. All right. Flash was extremely pervasive in 2001, 2002. Gonna kinda cut to the chase here. There was an issue reported in Flash and uh, Macromedia's response, so Macromedia owned it at the time, Adobe went on to purchase it. Macromedia's response was, it's simply a software crash, it's not a security issue. And Flash is a constrained environment by design. You would never get the virus to work. Well, if you remember anything over the next decade or more after that, there were constant vulnerabilities in Flash that were being exploited. It was a constant race to up, upgrade machines and patch and put in workarounds and there were O days. Uh, so this was a pretty enlightening piece of information. Uh, but it really is a sign of the times. Microsoft, Adobe, Macromedia and others, it was a common response. No big deal. That thing ain't a vulnerability. It's not a security issue. It's a crash, it's a performance issue. Turn your screen blue. Won't do anything bad. It's not like it's taking social security numbers. To give you a little bit more flavor of this time period, Interbase was a database package. It had a compiled in back door with the username politically, 
and the password correct. All right, so OWASP Top 10 uh, came out in 2003. It's had a number of iterations since then. I think most recently in 2017. It gets rejiggered around. There's a lot of political infighting. Um, kind of the takeaway here is, boy, a lot of these uh, vulnerabilities or risks, because they've changed the terminology, have persisted over the last 15 years. Sure, some of them were renamed and combined or split apart uh, or removed just because certain people were sick of seeing them in there and who's going to pay attention if it's the same 10 every three years? We've got to throw something new in there. But uh, it's not something that evolves all that rapidly. All right. There's a sort of the uh, peak, or roughly the peak, maybe a couple years later, of, of worms and, and viruses. We weren't as creative with coming up with names of, of malware back then. You know, today, you have to have a logo, you have to have a slogan. There'll be hell to be paid if you don't have a .com domain with it. So probably at least a day has to be spent concocting all that. Back then, you didn't do any of that. Usually, uh, the person who wrote the piece of malware came up with a name, and if the AV companies gave it a different name, they were pissed off and wrote a new version and um, had a bunch of back and forth. But hey, uh, Code Red was named after a, a pretty new Mountain Dew drink, and uh, Nimda was admin spelled backwards. So I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. Cross-site scripting, we, we think about today, and uh, a lot of it exists, and there's different forms of it. One of the earliest cross-site scripting incidents involved Hotmail before it was bought by Microsoft. It was injecting JavaScript, JavaScript into the from field uh, of the sender. And to get that to execute, all that had to happen was the uh, user that received that email had to open up their mailbox. They didn't have to hover over that email. They didn't have to click on it. They didn't have to do anything. The rendering of the sender in HTML with the JavaScript when they open their mailbox caused that to execute. That gives you an idea of the state of security at that point of time. You know, I mentioned before there were mailing lists. Uh, one was called Full Disclosure, existed for a long time, then went dormant and then uh, restarted a couple of days afterwards a few years ago. Back in the day, there were uh, unmoderated, semi-moderated, and moderated lists for sharing information. It's, it was a different world than uh, exists today. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to consider now, whether it's threat intel or anything related to security, there's a tremendous amount of information, willingness to share. We probably have more of a difficult time finding information that's uh, current, accurate, uh, and the, the best information to use. But uh, previously, there were only a few spots that you really had to look. Obviously, there were smaller private communities, but it was not as diverse and uh, readily accessible as it is today. Yeah, so that is uh, one of the things that's changed, right? So when we, when we think about what's changed, there are a lot of things that are good and bad that change, so right? Uh, we talk about encryption. Uh, encryption, we weren't able to do encryption for a long time because of uh, export laws that limited, um, limited the uh, key strength, um, our ability to use encryption outside the United States. Bill Clinton uh, eliminated most of that. I want to say that was in 2003, 2004. I don't cover that in here. Um, and now we kind of take it for granted that encryption is free. Uh, there's millions of encryption certs that you can get off of free um, services that was not possible back in the day. It was very difficult to implement, very costly. Uh, so a lot of things have changed both for good and for bad. Uh, we, uh, we know today there's a lot of bug bounty programs and third parties allow for reporting of vulnerabilities that they, they will then share with a the vendor. iDefense in this time period uh, was either the first or one of the first independent programs, they would pay individuals for reporting vulnerabilities, and then they would coordinate that response with the affected vendors. Uh, Tor was something that came out in this time period. And moving on to 2003, 2004, we had a space shuttle explode, Trump had a TV show, um, 
Paris Hilton was famous for a lot of bad reasons. Ken Jennings won a bunch of games on Jeopardy and we invaded Iraq. And that's how I sum up those two years. But then a really great tool came out, Metasploit. So before Metasploit, there were a bunch of independent scripts. I wouldn't say it took a lot of sophistication to get a hold of scripts and exploit vulnerabilities, but there was not a platform that was as readily available as was the case after Metasploit came out with plugins allowed other people to develop uh, additional exploits, and then this entire platform was built up that anyone could easily download and run, follow some simple instructions, and it really reduced the barrier for individuals both with uh, positive intent and negative intent to compromise and exploit vulnerabilities. And I think we have a lot to owe to where we are today, to HDMR, HD Moore, Metasploit, and all the other individuals that were involved in Metasploit in the early days. And it really drove the concept of pen testing and the ability to perform offensive attacks on organizations to test their security posture. Up until this point, though, we didn't really have a lot of laws, so many organizations didn't want to do anything because they were compliance-focused. Well, yeah, we understand it's a problem, but we're here to make widgets, and it won't happen to us, and we have other things we need to spend our money and resources on. California, where we are today, was the first state to implement a data breach notification law uh, involve personally identifiable information like social security numbers, driver's licenses, and names. The way it was written meant that a large number of organizations in other states were also impacted because they had customers or records of individuals in California. So this started a whole um, downhill snowball effect where other states began uh, creating data breach notification laws. Interestingly, I think the 50th state didn't do so until either earlier this year or last year. There were three or so holdouts uh, the last four or so years, but California was the one that really you know, paved the trail. In the same time period, HIPAA came out with its security rules, PCI came out with its, uh, its data security standards, and uh, you know, at that point, there was a whole lot of compliance that organizations had to at least start to consider at least those that were impacted. Within a few years, there was hardly an organization that wasn't impacted to some degree. And so that was, that was really what led to a lot of change. It was kind of slow change, but it, it led to a lot of change in the field of information security. Uh, for these two years, there were a lot of worms, SQL Slammer, so big. They all kind of run together. You can look them up if you don't know them. All right, so moving ahead a little bit, yeah, truthiness was a word. Uh, there was this guy that was a meme. This guy died. A couple guys retired. There was a flood that was a humongous deal. And then uh, the VP shot his buddy accidentally. So that's what those two years were all about. We, we take for granted now where we are from an OS int perspective, but uh, Johnny Long was pretty instrumental at... Uh, raising awareness of the concept of Google dorks or Google hacking, he came out with a book. And uh, it became very popular to perform searches on Google to look for information. It is something we still do today. It's not the only search engine we use. We've moved on from uh, search engines to other applications to perform the same types of tasks. We uh, do other things to create puppet accounts and get access to data in other ways, but we're mining publicly accessible or semi-publicly available information, um, and the attackers are doing it, the defenders are doing it too. And this was an early point where this was occurring. Backtrack was a platform, uh, Debian-based, had a bunch of security technologies on it, and morphed into Kali, which pretty much anybody on the offensive side of security uses today. If they're not using it, they're quite the contrarian. In the same time period, there is a guy, last name Anchetta. He was the first person charged with controlling a botnet. He had about a half million computers under his control. So we're talking a whole lot more than uh, Mafia Boy with his hundred. And he was sentenced to five years in prison. Don't actually know how long he served. A lot of these people that were sentenced to these prison terms ended up serving quite a bit l less than uh, what they were sentenced to. 
So 2007 to 2008 is where things really got interesting from my standpoint because iPhone was released, Android was released, and now, oh my God, there's mobile. Cloud had already existed, but cloud was starting to become a, a, a big deal. We had Rick Rolling, a couple of fast guys in the Olympics, Obama became president. And uh, since we're in the like IPA capital of, of the world here, I, I would be remiss not to mention this was a time period where there was a worldwide hop shortage. Hops became very expensive. You cannot make beer without hops. Well, you really can't make IPA without hops. So this was kind of a big deal. And so at this point, many people, and I'll say I was one of them, I fought mobile, I fought BYOD, I fought cloud. I'm like, we don't know how to secure this. We can't do this yet. Well, damn, that was a mistake. Um, a lot of us made that mistake. If we look back, that was something that set us back at least five years because we didn't recognize that that was a freight train that was coming. It was gonna happen, and us saying no repeatedly just took away all of our credibility. Uh, we were in better positioned to acknowledge it's something that was coming, find ways to test it small, inform the stakeholders about the risk, and get our asses in motion to figure out solutions. That's not what we did. Probably, in my mind, the biggest failure in the history of information security was that time period. Uh, before the DBIR, um, I didn't really think a lot about most security publications that came out from security vendors. By the way, I work for a security firm now, so I'm saying this. I'm not pointing any fingers at anyone in particular, but let's look at it more like I have a lot of admiration for the folks at Verizon to put together the DBIR, because they pulled together a tremendous amount of information, got other orgs to share information, did awesome analysis, data science, great visualization, present the information in a really usable, actionable way. And within a couple of years, got to the point where if you were in security, you waited for that day the DBIR came out, and you wanted that, and your executives wanted it. And that's where we are today. And a lot of the guys, maybe all of them that were on that team, I think have left and gone on to some uh, very interesting roles. But we still have it here today. And it's really set the bar higher for others that are producing reports and uh, publications. It, it's um, you know, definitely at a different tier than it was before that point. You could get in a lot of trouble uh, if you posted uh, this short string of information. The MPAA and AACS would come after you. So a lot of people posted it and it just kind of got out of control. This was also a time period. We, we knew that uh, federal agencies and others were surveilling us. But a, a published affidavit came out revealing that the uh, FBI was tracking the source of an email bomb threat via a program that was uncertain to exist, confirmed their spyware capabilities, and quite a few other things came out over the following two years that validated that this was occurring. So it wasn't like we waited till Edward Snowden to go, ah, uh, yeah, whoa, I didn't, I didn't know about this. We're talking 10 years before the fact. 2009, 2010, Kanye and Taylor Swift had an awkward moment. Uh, the iPad was released. The vice presidential candidate invented a word, um, repudiate. I thought that was, no, no. It's like a mash of refute and repudiate. It might have been like repudiate. I think she said that Shakespeare coined words, so why couldn't she? Tyler, uh, Tiger Woods um, had his mind on other things besides golf. Uh, Lindsay Lohan was having troubles, and then uh, there was a big oil spill. And Barnaby Jack meant to give a presentation in 2009 to Black Hat, and he wasn't able to give it. He gave it in 2010 did a couple of exploits of vulnerabilities, one remote, one requiring physical access, caused a bunch of fake money to spit all these machines. It was pretty awesome if you were there. And, um, you know, it, it was a real threat. It affected financial institutions, and if you look, even over the last few months, uh, there have been incidents involving people exploiting ATM machines, AT machines, uh, getting them to spit out money, and they coordinate it, and you can make a lot of money doing this. He was involved in this research. He was an early uh, researcher in medical devices. Unfortunately, um, he left this earth prematurely uh, five or so years ago. But uh, I have a lot of admiration for him and, and the trail he paved. 
Shodan uh, was a thing that showed up about eight, nine years ago. It was a search engine for computers. That was a little different. It's, it's a huge deal today. You can find the Internet of Things and uh, physical facilities and webcams and everything under the sun using it. And it does a fantastic job surfacing a lot of issues and the media runs with it. I think it's fantastic and it's run by a team of one, or at least, at least I believe is a team of one. All right, we're getting closer to today. Um, a bad guy died, another bad guy died, we killed a bad guy. She sang a song about six feet under something, Party Rock was in the house tonight, and OMG LOL uh, entered the Oxford Dictionary. Yeah, that's pretty legit. Then a couple of uh, platforms launched uh, to allow people to uh, earn money by finding bugs in company services where they were quite happy to pay money to have this happen. And there were bug bounties before this. Um, Katie Musaurus from Microsoft set up the first one at Microsoft. She later went on to set up one at, or with, a, with other people at the Pentagon. Uh, yeah, they, weren't, they weren't really that prominent. Bug Crowd, Hacker One, and some others have really led a lot of organizations to set up bug bounty programs, some earlier than they probably should, and has made it so that people can earn a living performing bug bounties. Now, it's harder today because there's a lot more competition, and you may find a bug that somebody already found, but this is now a very pervasive thing today that's not going away. Five years back, the, the government shut down. We all know about Snowden. There was a Malaysian plane that got lost, a bombing at the Boston Marathon, and ISIS surfaced. And Taylor Swift that we saw earlier, she's like a stage security individual that has a Twitter presence for the last five years, and says a lot of really profound things that people uh, share out. She has 100, 200,000 followers. She has 100, 200,000 followers. She runs a site called Decent Security, which is pretty good for consumers, and I'm actually aware of some uh, corporate organizations that use it to uh, coordinate their phishing uh, takedowns and reporting of malicious URLs. So uh, yeah, Taylor Swift, she's doing a lot for the uh, community. I already mentioned Katie. Sometimes she has pink hair, sometimes she does not. Now Brian Krebs uh, used to work for the Washington Post. He got fired. Probably the best thing could have ever happened to Brian because within a day he started up Krebs on security and pretty quickly he started breaking huge stories like the Target data breach and the Home Depot data breach and having awesome conversations with Russians in the cyber underground who would tell him about other competitors of theirs to get them busted and vice versa and then they get mad at him and SWAT him and send SWAT teams to his house and so he's had to move and take a lot of steps so that um, no one can really find where he is. Um, that's the downside. That's the downside of the situation but he's done a lot to uh, get information out about security incidents and so he's played a really key role in security over the last 20 years. All right, getting closer. We found water and ice on a couple of planets and moons. Took worldwide extreme poverty below 10%. Eliminated rubella in the Americas and then uh, we're able to observe wavelengths of gravity to validate Einstein's theory. So a pretty awesome effing time it's been all this great stuff, and then we came out with these amazing contraptions you could ride without a handlebar, but they caught on fire, and mattresses that you could roll up and have shipped to you, and that's, I mean, you gotta have that. I mean, mattresses that you can roll up. Right, and so there've been a lot of security companies like the last few years, they have had these crazy ideas like, hey, that's new, and so they get Series A funding or seed funding, and it's just not really a viable idea, or, you don't really know what's going on behind the hood, but there's cool visualizations and everybody loves it. And I'm not really sure exactly what happened to Norse. I know the CEO wasn't quite sure what happened when the media asked him, hey, what happened to your company? But they had this uh, really cool map and did things. And then 
a couple of guys, Bob Rudis, who used to be on the Verizon DBIR team, and Alex Pinto, a big data scientist, threw some code up on GitHub, and you can build your own now, and then Threat Butt came out, and it has one you can look at, and it's really cool and actionable and useful. And then there were some breaches like uh, the, the Democratic campaign, um, the Me Too movement, some dictators, Elon Musk smoking pot in California, Elon Musk, 20 other things, Putin, Trump, and it canceled Two Broke Girls. I hate that show. I just wanted to see if uh, any of you laugh at that. Apparently not. Um, nothing happened in 2007, 2018, so we'll move on from there. And actually, so crypto jacking became a thing, and then uh, that kind of moved to uh, cryptographic uh, leverage, leveraging your uh, computer to do crypto jacking, uh, taking your CPU and GPU to use it to mine coins. So when you think about this, like it was pretty quick that it went uh, from ransomware, which is still out there, still effective to that because the economics were such that it's easy just to switch and move to that model. There were some free tools made available. You didn't have to have any sophistication. You just grabbed some JavaScript code, stuck it on your website, stuck it on websites that weren't yours, and made some money, renting other people's computers out that they didn't know about. Uh, big advances in OPSEC, I think, are going to happen soon. If you think about the, the GM of the 76ers, he had some fake Twitter accounts, posted some things, some attribution was done. Eh, it turns out it was him and or his wife, and he lost his job. A lot of people are like all about uh, the blockchain now. I like to think about it like this. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah, I'm not sure everything is going to be solved by blockchain. If you have a different theory, talk to me after this presentation. I'd love to know what your theory is. So these guys circled around 20 years later, earlier this year, went back to Congress, um, you know, looked a little more cleaned up, have gray hair, and talked about the state of things. So that was, that was kind of nice. All right. So kind of kind of wrap things up. So we're kind of resetting things to zero, right? That was the last 20 years. We have the next 20 years. So maybe we haven't solved everything over the last 20 years, but I really do believe we've made tremendous progress. There's been a lot of rapid change on, on the business side, technology side, threat landscape. We, we continue to and we will continue to encounter lots of friction, um, resource constraints, and all kinds of other challenges, that's the way it is. We're no different than any other form of risk management, whether it's safety or things that deal with pollution or anything like that. It's the same thing. Those are just fields that are, you know, 100, you know, 50, 100, 200 years older than us. We're in our infancy still. And we have amazing tools, commercial and open source. The hard part now is figuring out, like, how do you, how do you integrate them? Do you reduce your, your vendor portfolio and go with less best of breed, um, how do you get these things to work together? But a lot of organizations are realize if you're gonna sell a tool to somebody, you better have a really good API because people aren't gonna buy it. So uh, you know, we have some interesting challenges in front of us. I think it's a really, really awesome time. We still don't have a good handle on IoT, especially in the enterprise. Um, even large organizations manufacture IT, IoT don't have a good handle of it. You know, those that are crowdsourced don't, don't know what they're doing at all. So that, that's gonna be a problem for us. We got on the uh, containerization bandwagon pretty fast, realized uh, this train's gonna happen. Uh, we better not do what we did when Cloud General came out. Um, so we, we're in okay shape with containerization, but serverless has hit us, and we're not really doing a good job there. And so we should ask ourselves like, what we can learn from the last 20 years and, and what we can do differently. And we're not gonna have control over everything. But you know, really, the best we can do you know, when faced with these complex changes is it do what we can control. Don't hold on to the paradigms of the past. I know there's probably still some of you in the room that still believe you have to have an eight character complex, multiple composition password that you change every 42 days, and you better memorize it, not write that down, and it has to be unique and not like the one before. Come on now, That's not, that doesn't work. That didn't work 20 years ago. I've been telling people for like the last 15 years that I put mine in my wallet I say it's good enough for my credit cards, why is it not good enough for my password? Sure, there's a attack vector or threat scenario where somebody could hit me, hit me over the head, there's a, a comic strip about that. But if I'm dead, I don't care. That's somebody else's problem. 
If I wake up in an alley, I'm going to go change my password. So not that big a deal for me. So um, a lot of this information was sourced from uh, Today in InfoSec, which is a Twitter account that I am the custodian of. If you're not familiar with it, and you'd like to know about things that happened on this day or were announced on this day in the year past, check it out. And uh, yeah, emoticons. That's all I have for you. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me here at TorCon. Did anyone recognize themselves in the slide? Hmm? No? I'm not certain, but I'm going to show you the slide because I think you might have been in it. I'm not sure. <laughs>